we all want to be heard. We all want people, um, it, it's part of what it means to love someone, is to empathize with them, to really understand and hear the challenges that they face. And I think that's especially true as we rel- relate to our children. Listen well to them. Hear what they're saying. Do your best to empathize with them. We, another one of our children, we were leaving, and, and our chil- one of our kids was on a uh, tear the night before we left. And normally it's sort of this, you know, escalating, stop it, and you know, we, get, we get angry and that sort of thing. And Sarah, in this moment, sort of stepped back and placed herself in the shoes of, of this child, one of our children, and really kind of understood all of this was about the fact that we were leaving and that he was going to be with his grandparents um, because there's kind of a, been a pattern. But see, she, she didn't jump to try to fix the behavior and stop it. She took a moment, stepped back, and tried to understand him, which is all that the lady was asking for. <laughs> the nail in the head, those snag sweaters. Um, that's all she was asking for. And, and, and it, it's important that we do that with our own children. Next, um, just have fun as a family. I mean, you could do it. This is, this is um, you, could, you could take all of this and sort of run in the completely wrong direction with it. Um, at the end of the day, just have a good time as a family. Teach them the joy of the Christian faith through your life as a family, that it's joyous. It's a joyous occasion. I have a, a pastor friend that has said that he's done lots of counseling with lots of children that grew up um, that have been alienated by the church. And he says, none of them have ever said, my family had too much fun. All we were doing was having fun. These kids had miserable experiences that were in the church and they, le- they left the church, not so much because they t- were taught the wrong things, because they're, it was just a miserable family experience. So just have fun. Love them. Enjoy it. Enjoy how fast it I mean, realize how fast it goes by. And, and, and enjoy them. Now, there's a poem called Those Winter Sundays. I'll give you a little background on the I like to know kind of who I'm reading. And I'm not a, I don't read poetry much. I'm trying to read more because I think it's important. I think all of the disruption and fren- frenetic kind of feel that we have towards life, in large part that's due to like smartphones and email and constant information flow, poetry is the a- antidote to all of that, I believe, in many ways. It slows us down. You don't get poetry um, quickly. You have to ponder, you have to meditate, you have to chew and savor, as Psalm 1 told us. So Robert Hayden was a, grew up in um, Detroit. He was adopted by a, um, a family, in a blue-collar family, inner, inner city Detroit. They were a Baptist family. Um, and years after, he, he had a career as a poet. I believe he taught at a university somewhere. And, and he, at some point, he wrote this poem as an adult. He says, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made faint fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call. And slowly I would rise and dress fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? What do you, what do you make of that? It, let, me, let me ask a different question. Is there any phrase or word that you like? That you, just... A lot of poetry is just even the sound, sounds that it makes. Um, what, what lines do you like? What phrases, what words catch your attention or caused you to kind of pause? Yeah. 
hear the cold splintering. Yeah, what does that mean? Hearing the chronic angers of that house. I'm not sure exactly, but it doesn't sound good. What do you make of this son's relationship to his father? What's that? Servitude? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Regret. Yeah. He's definitely looking back in regret. Right. Yeah. So his perception, I don't know when he, what he's referring, I'm, I'm guessing maybe a teenage, teenager. Um, his perception doesn't, nec- at, the, at the teenager doesn't necessarily line up with the reality, it seems. Wow, I mean, it's, 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 it's so short, and yet this is what poetry does. It's like a minefield of, of jewels and golds with every word is just packed with, with, with meaning. And um, in this short phrase, I, you feel like you have such a full picture of this, of this father and even of the son as well. It's, it's an encouragement to me at reading this. And I, I don't get the sense that dad was perfect. I get the sense that he was pretty austere, but I, I do believe he loved his son. I mean, he's looking back, to, and the son believes that. Um, it's very encouraging because our, our children are watching us. In the times that we don't even, I mean, do you think his dad would have thought, my son's going to write a poem about me as I'm, that I make fires for him every morning and polish his shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm making the fire in here, son. Polishing your shoes. <laughs> no. Totally oblivious. I mean, he's just doing what he needs to do as a father. But the children are watching. Like, they're watching. And that's, that's part of my point. You can, you can do all of this, but... Well, but if it's not coming out of, back to the who of the teacher, if it's not coming out of a changed heart, and it's not coming out of your own kind of servitude to, to Christ, your service to Christ, and out of obedience to Christ, your children will see right through it. And it, it's not going to be, I don't think it'll be good. The importance of being an example for our children. And as you said, Vincent, how, how, I mean, how, tr- how true it is that this is kind of a metaphor, this whole experience that we all experience. As you get older, you know, you begin to see more and more what your parents did for you. Um, but it's true of our experience with Christ, right? We're so oblivious to so many of his blessings and his love towards us. Um, but we, we, we grow in that over time. Any other thoughts on this? Great poem. I, I, I've read it a few times, and I mean a number of times, and I'm just always, I'm always moved by it. So, I want to close by looking at a story of someone, because I've talked about the importance of story to our children. And for that, for how how it orients them in the world, and of course the Bible is uh, primary in, in this, in the story of, of what Christ has done for us. But I want to close to kind of in an effort to kind of summarize everything that we've covered so far. I want to provide you with a concrete picture of what it might look like in the life of a person. And to do that, I want to look at the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, he was a German Christian. The, the title of this book is Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. So he was living during World War II and the rise of the Third Reich, and he does not like what he sees at all. While most German Christians were sort of just swept, there was a cultural Christianity that was just swept right up into Hitler's master plan. 
Bonhoeffer and a number of others said, this is evil, and we've got to put a stop to this. And he was involved in plots to assassinate Hitler, to, to put an end to him and to end the Third Reich because of what damage it was doing. Um, and eventually, he died. He died, um, he died for, for doing that. Um, and so I, I want us to look at his life and look at how he grew up and some of the things that his family did because I think it's helpful, and it, it really summarizes a lot of what we've covered. Um, and I'm going to open, this book opens, this is a good, this is a fun, a, a good book, um, by the way. It's by Eric Metaxas. Um, so, it says, uh, the book opens with a quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 8 through 12. 2 Corinthians says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. So I've I've tried to think about a simple way of describing your task as parents. And, and one of the things that came to mind is we need to teach our children to die well, to learn how to die well. Christ said, take up your cross and follow me. I mean, throughout the New Testament, there's this theme of dying to ourselves so that we can find life. And so Bonhoeffer, obviously, he, he eventually dies um, like we all do. But I think throughout his life, we see a life of continual dying to things. But let's begin with his birth. On February 4th, 1906, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his twin sister were born to Karl and Paula Bonhoeffer in Breslau, Germany. Carl, his dad, was a renowned psychiatrist, and his mom, Paula, was a teacher. And his family had this remarkable background. And um, he came from a lot of bright people (laughs) and and people that had done some great things in in Germany. So he has this rich um, past. And one of his friends, one of Bonhoeffer's friends, who was in prison at the same time as him and narrowly escaped and later wrote a biography about Bonhoeffer, says this. The rich world of his ancestors set the standards for Dietrich Bonhoeffer's own life. It gave him a certainty of judgment and manner that cannot be acquired in a single generation. Um, Again, the importance of what we do for our subsequent generations. David Brooks, has, he's a columnist um, and author. He, he said that it takes at least three generations to build a career. Right? The idea that um, what we do is so connected to our, our past. And here, here you see that. Dietrich had this certainty of judgment and manner that you just can't get in a single generation. He grew up in a family that believed the essence of learning lay not in a formal education, but in the deeply rooted obligation to be guardians of a great historical heritage and intellectual tradition. Now, did you hear that? That's very interesting. His family, in large part, taught at the university level, and yet they realized that the heart of education did not lay in formal education. Um, Much of what we said, right? We can do things formally, but the impact of what we do happens in more of the informal times that we have with our children. And, of course, they had this obligation to be guardians of a heritage. And that's echoes of Psalm 78 that we looked at, this idea that of, of passing down to the next generation. So um, the, the, the works of the Lord. So I want to I just kind of give you a picture of what growing up was like for, for Dietrich. Um, he, there, there were eight children in all, all under 10 years, within 10 years. So they're very tightly packed, eight of them. They lived in a gigantic, rambling, three-story home with gabled roofs, numerous chimneys, 
a screen porch and a large balcony overlooking the spacious garden where the children played. Remember the importance of playing outside? Best way to restore your child's imagination? Keep them indoors. Dad took great joy in the children. Um, an example of the kind of thing that he would do is he um, built, they had a tennis court, and he would turn it into an ice rink in the winter where they could ice skate. They had untold numbers of animals inside and outside of the house in the middle of town, and they put on plays and dramas with their mom in the home. And I want to just mention some things related to, to, the, to the mom, because one of the um, important things that we have, uh, themes that has made its way through the course of these talks, is the value of, of, of a mom in the life of a child. Sarah Edwards was the one that was credited with all of the work of those descendants. Um, and, and Bonhoeffer as well. The mom homeschooled all of the children until they were eight. The children then went to the local public schools where they all did very well. She had them memorize an impressive number of poems, hymns, and folk songs, which she taught her children. They did, when they were younger, they did family puppet theater. She put on a performance of Little Red Riding Hood every December 30th, her whole life long. It wasn't the British Council's version. She expected her children to show great religious resolution. Uh, M M Eric Metaxas, the author, describes her as the soul and spirit of the house. Daily life was filled with Bible reading and hymn singing, and all of it led by Frau Bonhoeffer. Her reverence for scriptures was such that she read Bible stories to her children from the actual Bible text and not from a children's retelling. Which, by the way, I meant to say, the children's Bibles are great, but don't hesitate to start reading from the actual English translation of a Bible um, because you'll be surprised at how much literacy they can acquire, biblical literacy, when you do that. So, so moms, I know you feel like you're in the grind so often, but it, you're doing such an important work. Um, I've looked kind of at the positive impact of a mom. I kind of want to look at it from the uh, a negative angle. And this is uh, C.S. Lewis. I'm, I'm thinking about him because of this biography that I'm reading. And in Surprised by Joy, his, his autobiography, he describes the death of his, of his mom. He, when he was nine years old, his mom um, had cancer, and she died within six or seven months. It's very quick um, death. And this is what he says. With my mother's death, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, many stabs of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. Like, this is, <laughs> this was completely devastating for him. Um, and then you look on the flip side, you look at the impact that these mothers have, have had in these great, in Bonhoeffer and, Ed, and Edward's children. Um, you guys are doing such a great work. It's often not appreciated in our own culture, by the way. So I'll, I'll recognize that. So you look at the home here, the Bonhoeffer home, it sounds like, it's like the Von Trapps. <laughs> Singing, dancing, running around outside in the German woods. Um, let's let's turn to dad for a moment. The, the father was agnostic. Um, and as we've kind of been talking, you may have, in, in your mind, you may have had like kind of an, an ideal sort of arrangement, mom, dad, devout Christians. I think it's an encouragement that in God, God's providence doesn't always work out the way we would necessarily have hoped. Um, but God still does great things within this family. He loved, he loved his, his wife. Um, it's said that the Bonhoeffers enjoyed a happy relationship, the mom and dad, in which each partner adroitly supplemented the strength of the other. At their golden wedding anniversary, it was said that they had not spent a total of one month apart during their 50 years of marriage, not even counting single days. I'm going to read a quote that gives you a little picture as well of, of, of Father Bonhoeffer. It says that her, 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 his daughter... Dietrich's sister says regarding her, her dad that he had great tolerance that left no room for narrow-mindedness and broadened the horizons of our home. 
He took it for granted that we would try to do what was right and expected much from us. But we could always count on his kindness and the fairness of his judgment. He had a great sense of humor and often helped us overcome inhibitions with a timely joke. He had too firm a grip on his, upon his own emotions to allow himself to ever speak a word to us which was not wholly suitable. His dislike of cliches did at times make us feel inarticulate and uncertain of ourselves, but it has had the effect that as adults we no longer had any taste for catchwords, gossip, commonplaces, or commonplaces. He himself would never have used a catchword or a trendy phrase. Didn't tolerate self-pity and valued simplicity and humility. So what in general did this kind of cultivate in the Bonhoeffer among the children? Well, they were all readers. They read a lot. They were musicians. They all began playing the piano by age eight. Um, they were gardeners. All of, throughout their lives, they, they maintained extensive gardeners. They liked to be outside as adults. They were lovers of, of heirlooms. Their house was filled with all of these um, old heirlooms, paintings and uh, just items that surrounded their house. And you think about the story. There's a number of stories about children getting stuck in museums. Uh, kids love those stories. It's, it's, it's a connection to the past, and that seems to be the case for Bonhoeffer and his, fam and, and his siblings as they grew up um, in this home with all these heirlooms. Um, they loved tradition. They had liturgies, thick liturgies. I'm going to read one on Christmas. Um, Christmas, every, on Sundays of, during Advent, they would assemble um, around the dinner table to sing Christmas carols. Papa, Dad, joined us too and read the fairy tales. Oh, they're reading fairy tales. The fairy tales of Anderson, Hans Christian Andersen, Little Mermaid. Christmas Eve began with the Christmas story. The whole family sat in a circle, including the maids in their white aprons, aprons, all solemn and full of expectation till our mother began to read. She read the Christmas story with a firm, full voice, and after that, she always intoned the hymn, hymn This is the day that God has made. The lights were, all, were now extinguished, and we sang Christmas carols in the dark until our father, who had slipped out unnoticed, had lit the candles at the manger and the tree. Now the bell sounded, and we three small ones were allowed to go first into the Christmas room, to the candles at the tree, and there we stood and sang happily. The Christmas tree is the loveliest tree. Only then did we look at our Christmas presents. I'm sure we all have Christmas traditions. That traditions of any kind, thick traditions, have a huge impact on our, on our kids. The liturgies. So that's a little bit about his upbringing. So the question is, you know, what did this produce? What 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 is what does an adult Bonhoeffer look like? Particularly Dietrich. Moving forward. Well, when Bonhoeffer went off to college to university. And he, um, he did really well. Um, he quickly did all the degrees he could do, and he became a highly regarded theologian. And he traveled to the U.S. And one of the things that would frustrated him, he spent time in New York, and one of the things that frustrated him is he could not find a church that preached the gospel. This is what he says. In New York, they preach about virtually everything. Only one thing is not addressed, or is addressed so rarely that I have as yet been able to hear it, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, sin and forgiveness, death and life. So he gives up hope finding a church in New York. Um, but then he starts attending an African-American church in Harlem. He starts going to all these African-American churches in Harlem because there he heard the gospel preached. And he, he resonated with the difficulties that African-Americans were facing in 19... 1920s, 1930s, and um, in fact, one of, he told his students later that he had in Germany, he said that one of his colored, this is a quote, one of his colored friends with whom he had traveled through the states, he told of the piety of the Negroes. At the beginning of the evening, he said, when I took leave of my, of my black friend, he said to me, make our sufferings known in Germany, tell them what is happening to us, and show them what we are like. And so his, his relationship in the, with these um, churches deeply impacted them, and they, I think, we'll, we'll see this in a second, they caused him to die to the ease and convenience of never being with the marginalized. 
and the broken. Because the time that he spent here softens his heart towards the broken. And he had every excuse to stay up in kind of high circles. He came from high class. He had all the degrees he could need. He was, he was a great scholar in his own right. And yet he forfeits that. He receives opportunity to get this cushy academic job at Union Seminary in New York. He would have been set for life. He would have done a great job. But this is what he says. Actually, before he says it, I'm gonna, this is what happens. This is kind of the moment. He, he's watching, um, he, he's read the book All Quiet on the Western Front, a German book. And he goes to a theater and he watches this movie. And, and, and the movie, um, I don't know if you've read the book. I read it in high school. Um, it's, a, it's a good book, but it, it's one of the books that Hitler burned um, as part of his book burning effort. But at the beginning of the film, the teacher over these German students says um, in Latin, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is a sweet and fitting thing to die for one's country. And by the end of the movie, everybody in the film is either dead or they've gone completely mad, right? And Bonhoeffer sees the tragedy of war. He's breaking down in the middle of this movie, right? He's, he sees a story, and the story grips him, to, and he acts in response to this story of all quiet on the Western Front. He becomes a committed pacifist, and he says, I'm going to take up the cause of, the, I cannot leave the Jews high and dry in my own country. And this is what he says. I have had the time to think and to pray about my situation and that of my nation, and to have God's will for me clarified. I have come to the conclusion that I have made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period of our national history with the Christian people of Germany. I shall have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. My brothers in the con confessing synod wanted me to go. They may have been right in urging me to do so, go going to America, but I was wrong in going. Such a decision each man must make for himself. Christians in Germany will face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation, thereby destroying our civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make that choice in security. So he goes back. He goes back to the wickedness and evil that he sees in Germany to go and serve. And he goes straight to Karl Barth, who's one of his friends and another great theologian of the 20th century. And, he, and Barth gives him a position in a university in Berlin. And it's important what he does with his students in Berlin. They're kind of surprised by Dietrich because he's not a conventional teacher at all. They sing songs in class together. He takes them regularly on hikes where he does teaching out in the woods um, and on the mountaintops. Um, so they get outside, and they're, they're studying script. They're actually studying scripture. which you don't, you don't do that in a German Bible class in the mid-1900s or the early 1900s, but he has them studying scripture. And so these three things are really kind of a summary of everything I've said. Like, what do you do as a parent? What do you do? Sing with your child. Sing carols, sing hymns. Read the scriptures together. Go on walks out in creation. Like, how do you, how does a person, how does a soul prepare to give their life for their neighbor and to, and to, in a fashion similar to Christ, to give up their life for a cause that is consistent with the gospel? They read scripture together, they take walks outside, and they sing together. That's what he's doing. So let's see what happens. Um, he, he is under close surveillance, Bonhoeffer, by the Gestapo, and he knows it. And he knows that his time is, is drawing near. Um, and he, actually, he has been engaged, he has recently become engaged to a Maria. For about three months, they've been engaged. So that's in the picture as well. And then he gets a phone call. He answers it. No one answers on the other side, and he knows exactly what's going on because he answered hello. They know that he's in the house. They're coming to get him. They walk in. He picks up his Bible. He follows them to the black Mercedes. They escort him to a concentration camp where he spends a year and a half in prison. And during 
and one morning, some of the prisoners asked him to lead them in worship. And so he somewhat reluctantly goes, and, and they begin to pray together. And he preaches to them from Isaiah 53, 5, which says, With his stripes we are healed. And then First, first Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And according to one of the witnesses that was there at that worship service, um, he says this, he had hardly finished praying his last prayer when the door opened and two evil-looking men in civilian clothes came in and said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, get ready to come with us. Those words, come with us, for all prisoners, they had come to mean one thing, the scaffold. We bade him goodbye, and he drew me aside and said, this is the end, for me, the beginning of life. Now, before all of this happens, he, he gave some prophetic comments on death to a church in London. He was preaching in London, and this is what he says. No one has yet believed in God and the kingdom of God. No one has yet heard the realm of the resurrected and not been homesick from that hour, waiting and looking forward joyfully to being released from bodily existence. Whether we are young or old makes no difference. What are 20 or 30 or 50 years in the sight of God? And which of us knows how near he or she may already be to the goal? That life really only begins when it ends here on earth. And that all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up. That is for young and old alike like to think about. Why are we so afraid when we think about death? Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear of it. Death is not wild and terrible. If only we can be still and hold fast to God's word. Death is not bitter if we have not become bitter ourselves. Death is grace, the greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild, death is sweet and gentle. It beckons to us with heavenly power, if only we realize that it is the gateway to our homeland, the tabernacle of joy, the everlasting kingdom of peace. How do we know that dying is so dreadful? Who knows whether in our human fear and anguish we are only shivering and shuddering at the most glorious, heavenly, blessed event in the world. Death is hell and night and cold if it is not transformed by our faith. But that is just what is so marvelous, that we can transform death. Now, I realize that this may be kind of a heavy note to end on, and that's not my in necessarily my intent. I began this talk by, by explaining our need, in order to be effective parents, our need to step up outside of the moment and take a broader vision. Like the, like the developers of New College, that anticipated a problem 500 years before it, it arrives. Looking down the generations, praying for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, obviously our kids. But I want to say, too, if, if we're going to be effective parents, we must also set our sights not just 100 years down the road, but to a completely different realm, like the new creation. We need to think about the new creation. Think about what will become of our children 5,000, 10,000 years from now. Because as Bonhoeffer says, life really begins when it ends here on earth. That all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up and the show begins. C.S. Lewis said, if you set your heart on the world, you lose both the world and heaven. If you set your heart on heaven, you gain heaven and the world is, is thrown into. And so as, as parents, um, it's important for us to think about that eternal scope of what it is we're doing. And to remember that the Christian life is about dying. Maybe not, it may not be martyrdom, but it's all about dying. It's about taking up our cross and following Christ. And we need to teach our, our children to die well. Because only when they, when they lose their life will they find it. That's the gospel.